After several months had gone by uneventfully, during which Melody's guardians had bitten their claws down to their cuticles night after night, such was the extent to which they felt on edge with regard to the whole messy debacle. Their nerves eventually calmed, and their blood pressure levels dropped back down to semi-normal upon seeing that business went on as usual. Weezer the geezer even went out of his way, bless his heart, to send Melody distinctive bouquets of exotic flowers, to say nothing of extravagantly generous gifts on her birthdays and holidays. She would occasionally have one of her secretaries send him a courtesy thank you for good measure. It should not go unremarked here that Melody had become the beneficiary of a trust fund set up by her legal guardians, which had just taken effect on her 16th birthday. It provided her with a monthly stipend that paid for her living sumpts, along with an intemperately opulent array of amenities to ensure that she maintained the bombastic, not to say unthrift, lifestyle to which she'd become intractably inured. Although she was now free to do as she feigned, devoid of the obeisance of servants hired by her guardians to breathe down her neck, and therethrough keep her out of harm's way. She knew that she would needs must, not for thy, learn the nuts and bolts of her newly gained independence. And this was by no means a Mickey Mouse task for the likes of such a pampered and youthful prima donna, acclimated as she'd become through her formative years to all the frills and perks of her privileged status, especially on account of the well-nigh impossible, if not madly deranged, expectations she'd accrued since the infancy of her nymphancy, of receiving prompt attempt to each and every one of her eccentric notions, errant whim-whams, and schoolgirl fancies. Build me a dacha for my pet ferret, on the double, she'd demand. I don't like that emerald chandelier in my spa. Get me a new one with rubies on it, she'd snap. I insist upon your wearing a clown suit whilst cleaning out my thunderbowl, she'd bark. her retinue of long-suffering domestics, housefraus, pillow-punchers, sheet-slingers, bottle-washers, major-domos, and the like, would stoically grin and bear her tyrannical, jingle-brained abuses, making every possible effort to ignore the fleas in their noses caused their through. They'd surreptitiously roll their eyes, grit their teeth, and piss themselves all the while, for not only did they fear for their livelihoods, but for their very lives as well. For they knew that their proud and exacting mistress would have no squeams about discharging them on the spot at the drop of a hat. It made no difference how minor the perceived infraction was, and none of her flunks could afford to lose their positions, however thankless, when taking under account the pestiferously cobwebby caste system that asserted an excruciating stranglehold over the current feudal economy, and especially since the paychecks they received for their services 
were just ever so slightly better than so-so, though far less than one could subsist on with any semblance of dignity, let alone self-respect.